Today, I'm driving a car from one of Britain's biggest manufacturers, but virtually forgotten today, and one of my favourite brands as well. Yes, I'm driving a Super Minx. Now, this isn't just a Minx, this is a Super Minx. The name Minx goes back a long way, to 1931 in fact, when it was a second model introduced by Hillman after they were taken over by the Roots Group after the Wizard, which is ever so slightly larger and pretty much forgotten sadly. It's a cute car. Now there is an unsubstantiated story that the Super Minx came about as a replacement to the Audax range of Minxes in the early 60s, but when it came out of the design stage, it was way too big and so they decided they had to make it as a second model. But I kind of can't believe that even in the 60s when everyone was smoking LSD and wearing mini skirts and playing some newfangled rock and roll on their gramophones, they'd have been that befuddled and confused they hadn't noticed that the new car was so much bigger than the one they were just trying to replace. So I'm not sure that's a true story or not. I'm just throwing it out there. But unlike the name Minx, which was used all the way from 1931 up until about 1970-71, the Super Minx name only existed on this car in its mark forms, obviously. Now, although it is bigger than the regular Minx, it is considered to be part of the Audax family, which was designed in-house by Roots Group's design team, but with help from Raymond Lowy's design consultancy, Raymond Lowy being famous for things like the 1953 Studebaker, lots of other really iconic bits of design, like those massive Art Deco streamlined trains in America and toasters and you name it. The Mark I Super Minx came out in 1961, and you can tell the design influences are still very late 50s with things like those Impala-esque micro fins on the back and this wraparound rear windshield, which continued into this, the Mark II, but on the Mark III, it became a flat rear glass and separate quarter lights, making the Mark III's feel a bit more fresh and modern and contemporary rather than this uh, more 50s styling piece here. The front of the car uses a lot of styling tricks to make it look low and wide. For example, the way this bonnet wraps over the top of the grille and the grille itself is full width. And these thin stacked slats make the car, I say, look, look wider than it actually is. These stacked lights with the indicator and side light above the headlight give it a slightly aggressive American appearance, slightly rakish. And throwing in these extra fog and spotlights give it a bit more of a sporting appearance as well. It's interesting as well as the Hillman script along the front, the main badge on the grille is actually a Roots Group badge and that's something you find all over the car, little Roots Group notes. They were very, very proud of themselves, of their company and very keen on publicity. If you saw a Roots Group product, you were very well aware of it. That was perhaps the greatest skill of Billy Roots and his brother, publicity and making the public aware they had stuff to buy and then selling it very effectively. It's quite a smart piece of design around the back as well. Quite often cars kind of peter out when they get to the rear quarter and the designer sort of seem to run out of ideas, but this actually looks quite cool. As I say, these uh, fins are a bit impala-like and throwing in vertical rather than horizontal or round lights just fills that gap really neatly. It gives it a really sharp look. These lights being Lucas, I suspect, will be found in various other Roots Group cars. I didn't think to check before I came out what other cars use the same tail lights as a, a Super Minx, but I'm convinced I've seen them in something else. Now, a slightly odd fashion of the, the 60s and 70s was hiding your lock for the boot behind a little flap, which is, I don't know, fade styling, but it's a little bit irritating to use. With the boot unlocked, there's a nice handle underneath there, and then you have quite a good sized boot. In the back, you have a fairly good sized duplex, twin level boot. The main area here extends here to the driver's side, but on the left hand side, or passenger side, you've got the fuel tank hidden behind this cardboard and a bit of sound deadening. And then above the axle, you do have a second area which is okay for a few more cases or bags. This would actually be the ideal car. If you're planning on abducting the crankies, this is actually the perfect vehicle because that up there is perfect for wee Jimmy. And then his accomplice would fit in the major area here quite well. Smart thinking from Roots Group. They did cover every eventuality. If you're looking for the spare wheel, it is underneath here, but not immediately underneath there because that is just the floor. The spare wheel and the jack are here, strapped to the underneath, getting dirty. Under the bonnet, we've got a four cylinder engine of 1.6 or 1592 cc, which ran up until 1964. And then from 65 until close of play, this thing existed as a 1.7 or 1725 cc. This kind of engine actually dates back to 1953 when it was first put into a car, but that then it was a 1390 or a 1.4. The Mark 1s came with a Zenith carburetor, but Mark 2s and 3s got the Solex instead. And so in this configuration, it made the grand total of 62 horsepower. Mm, it's a little bit tight getting in because the shape of the door and the size of the steering wheel make it a little bit hard to manoeuvre your legs around. And uh, this, I'll open the door again for this purpose, where the wraparound windscreen steps into the uh, door aperture, it makes it a bit tight for your knees. So you find this on most cars with wraparound windscreens. And the little handle here for shutting the door, which is a little bit tight for getting your fingers into. People were clearly smaller back in the 60s. I said that before and I've been told they weren't, but 
I think they were. Everything is blue in here, apart from the headlining, which is white. But everything else is blue in here, um, and the dashboard, which is kind of silvery grey, and the under dash shelf, which is black. But mostly it's blue in here. Blue carpet, blue... Well, this is actually called vinide. It's kind of like a plasticky vinyl stuff, which has lasted incredibly well. I mean, this car is, oh, it's 1964 to today. That's a long time. The dial says 4,500 miles, but that's either wrong, replaced, or has gone round the clock. I need to go and check on that. This vinide covering must be incredibly hard wearing because after all this time it is hardly worn at all. It's just a slight stretchy bag in the driver's seat where someone has sat more than anywhere else. But other than that, it's really, really great condition. The carpet is excellent as well. As far as I know, it's original. Interestingly, the Mark 1 cars had a bench seat as standard in the front and individual seats as uh, an option. But come the Mark 2, things moved on and these became the norm. It's quite a racy and intricate design in here. You have this kind of repeated groove effect on so many things. You've got running horizontally across the dashboard here, vertically across the centre part of the steering wheel, uh, concentrically around the door handles and window winders, which I think we can probably attribute to the Raymond Lowy aspect of the design, because that is kind of a, an Art Deco-y streamlining um, theme, which you would have found in those designs. The dashboard's quite well laid out for a 60s car, it's actually quite logical for once. Directly in front of you, looking through the spokes of the steering wheel, you have two big dials. The one on the left is your speedo, which has actually got miles and kilometres per hour, so I guess they're expecting some continental touring in a car like this. And the large one on the right is actually three small sub-dials hidden inside the main dial. Amps, oil pressure and water temperature. Separating them in between, you've got your fuel gauge. It's a 10.5 gallon or 47.6 litre fuel tank, which is actually quite impressive for a car of this size. Bear in mind the Rover P6, which is a bigger car with a bigger engine expected to tour further, had a 12 gallon tank, although it did have a 2 gallon emergency reserve as well. So okay, 3.5 gallons more than this. Then there are four warning lights above the fuel gauge. The left hand one is anyone masked into any kind of shape. It's a double ended arrow and green, which is for your indicators, the stalk being on the right hand side. Then you have a blue crystalline one for your main beam headlights, an orange crystalline one for the choke, which is over here on the far left of the dashboard controls, and a red one for the brakes. The rest of the controls are laid out as in odd even, odd even almost, or something like that, because you've got three of these black plastic knobs, the first one being the choke, the next one being the wipers, and the one over here on the far right corner is a push squeezy one for the windscreen washers. And then the other two ones, which odd even, odd even, you've got your lights, side dip beam, and the ignition. And above these controls, you've got your heater. Now, heaters were standard equipment on these cars, which is a good thing. Obviously, in the centre, you do have another Roots Group emblem, naturally. And having a heater standard on a car like this puts it into that kind of middle-class category. It's better than something a bit cheaper that wouldn't have had a heater as standard or had an underslung Smith's heater as almost an afterthought. This was integrated. This is part of it. This is built in. Although the radio remained an option. Then we have the steering wheel. This is a big, big wheel. This is huge. And uh, someone has put a grippy rim around it, so it's a little bit more grippy on its rim. And in the middle of that, you have a horn ring. Who doesn't like a horn ring? Let's click the ignition on and see how that sounds. Sounds like it could be louder. The only control stalk is your indicator here on the right hand side. Not self cancelling as far as I can tell from the short drive here to this car park. Main beam headlights on and off are on a foot switch down here on the floor to the left of the clutch. And then what else do you have in here? You have a big glove box, ugh, which gives you a nice steel T-shelf. I, I would recommend not using this in motion because that's a blade waiting to cut you in the sternum should you have an accident because in this car, there are no seat belts, front or back. It does, however, have a Jaeger clock, which looks very nice, but I suspect it may have been added after, <laughs> after the fact. There is a, it's screwed to the bottom of the ashtray, which makes me think it's definitely fitted after the fact. The ashtray, though, does have the same horizontal line pattern as the dashboard above it. Glancing around here, though, there does not appear to be a lighter socket, so you may extinguish your smoking equipment, but not, but not light it. Now, below that area, we do, of course, have the sub tea shelf. This is where you may place larger drinks, sandwiches, and snacks for the journey. It's full width and padded to protect your knees a little bit in the event of a crash. It does feel quite hard. I'm not sure that a thin bit of padding would do a lot to protect your shins were you to go hard into the back of another car. But down here on the right-hand side, on the driver's side, there is one rather nice Roots tuck, which many Roots cars got, which is additional air... Air conditioning is the wrong word, really. Air flow for the driver. There's a small vent. You can't see the lever at all. It's a black plastic um, handle which rotates down and that gives you air, extra air, blowing onto the driver's feet to cool your tootsies in hot weather. The only way you can tell it's there, if you're not aware of it already, is a little sticker here above the tea tray. 
Although it was a bench seat, it's not really a practical bench seat because this transmission tunnel is absolutely huge. Four speed manual in this car, which we'll come back to when we're on the road. But yeah, the width of this tunnel means that even having a bench seat, you'd struggle to get anything other than a baby sitting in the middle of this seat. Let's have a quick look in the back and then go for a drive. <clears throat> right. It's also a little bit tricky getting in the back because the gap between the front of the seat and the B post is quite short. But once you're in, it's a really quite a roomy and comfortable back seat. The same vinyl blue, finally plastic stuff on the seats and on the door cards as in the front, and the same uh, wind down windows and pulley door handle. The front seats have got a really nice big curve away in the backs, which means there's tons of room for your knees. That's quite a nice little bit of thought went into designing these chairs. So they're comfortable in the front and feel fairly well padded, uh, but leave tons of room in the back. I mean, this is actually a really impressive amount of legroom. The more I sit here and think about it, the more I think this is a really, not a huge car, but there's, if, you, if you're going out to the seaside for the day with the auntie and uncle and kids and everyone else crammed in the back, it's actually quite spacious. It's really rather impressive. The headroom is is good as well. I mean, I've got well that much, but that much space between the top of my head and the, and the ceiling. I'm like five ten, five eleven kind of height. And thanks to this big wraparound rear window, it feels really light and airy in here. You almost can't see the glass because there's no heating element in it. There's nothing to, to kind of distinguish that you're not just looking out into the outside world. There's only one light in the centre of the car, um, but both rear doors do have their own ashtray again and once again any smokers amongst you will have to bring your own lighting equipment because there's no rear lighters either uh, from my point of view there's nowhere to charge my phone so that's a little bit annoying it, were this my car i would have to do a little bit of wiring work to put in a 12 volt socket somewhere right explored the full extent of the rear of the car let's go and take it for a drive something i did just discover the hard way is that there are child locks on these back doors because i couldn't get out <laughs> choke pulled out a little tiny bit this car just coughs into life so easily sunglasses on because it's actually quite nice out today now the handbrake because it was a bench seat originally in the first ones is over to the right hand side it's a bit weird to get used to not difficult just you kind of forget where it is turning circles good I'll give it that oh I love a bit of wine from the gearbox It's a four-speed manual with synchro mesh on the top three, so it's straight cut bottom gear, so you get a lovely little whining as you're pulling away. I think in reverse I will as well. I look forward to hearing that. There was an automatic option. It was originally a Smith Easy Drive, but they dropped that and became a Borg Warner BW35, which is found in literally everything else in the world. This car is currently for sale at Sussex Classics in Crawley Down. Check out the link to the website in the description below because this car is an absolute peach. Someone is going to buy this and love it. Maybe it could be you. The car's got quite a nice little whoa, lift and bounce to it. It's perky as it drives down the road. It has independent front suspension with coils and an anti-roll bar and at the back it's a live rear axle. And that actually works really well because the ride is beautifully supple and yet quite sporting and the thing can be thrown into a corner with plenty of gusto and it really will stick. <laughs> Extreme caution when people are pulling out of blind junctions because I've got no seat belts or airbags. I do not wish to crash this car one little bit. Braking power though is quite good. So the Mark 1's got unassisted Lockheed 9 inch drums all round, but come the Mark 2, thankfully, power assistance and front discs became the standard option. Corners quite fruitily. This is fun, it really does feel planted. It's a lovely car. The driving position is though a little bit upright. I don't think you can change the, the rake of the, um, 
the rear seats and they're putting me very, very vertical. And uh, being an early 60s car, there are of course no standard or available as an option from the factory headrests. I believe someone commented in a previous video that you could buy aftermarket ones that slid over the side, but that's not factory. There's a lot of wind noise coming through this thing. It does have little quarter lights in the front. Actually, the wind noise goes away when you open the quarter light. That's a nice bit of ventilation, so uh, you can choose to have hot and cold from here or through on your feet or through the little light just there. That's quite nice. I'm going to pull in here and move the GoPros around. No power steering either. Although this is a 1964 car, the Mark II came out in October 62, and that brought with it a whole load of revisions to the car. For example, you've got the Borg Warner 35 Auto Box option came in with that. The uh, greasing points all around the car were deleted for the Mark II. Front disc brakes becoming standard, that was a thing. And of course the individual front seats are standard. They kept on revising it as the car went along. They were very good at introducing new things, new improvements, keeping the car current and making it a thing that wasn't stagnating. Something that, say, the uh, Austin cars didn't really change that much throughout their lifetime. The Roots cars were much better at evolving and staying current. So where does a Hillman Supermix fit in the uh, the geography of 1960s motoring, or what would it be the equivalent to today? Well, it's rivals at the time, the things like the Vauxhall Victor, the Ford Corsair. Of course, Austin Cambridge would have been a, a major competitor to it. And the British group was absolutely huge. They had so many different brands going on, and cars, commercials, you name it, they, they had it. And this is kind of a mid-range car, not as posh as a Humber, not as sporting as a Singer, uh, it was, uh, yeah, just a nice middle-class, everyday car. When I was trying to work out what it was the equivalent to in today's money, if you like, um, so Vauxhall was its a, a key competitor, or an Austin, aid, an Austin Cambridge was a key competitor, but it's not quite the same. It is in that same kind of price bracket and, and market, but it's the kind of thing where they'd be trying to appeal to the person who was maybe considering a Vauxhall or a Ford, but wanted something a bit different, but for the same kind of money. So it's perhaps more accurate to say it's more like a French car, more like a, it's more like a Peugeot. It's like a, like a Peugeot 406 of its time. Okay, that's not even very current either, thinking about it. Sorry, there's a Fiat Coupe Turbo in that car park. That's all very, very distracting. It's very much like a, maybe it's, it's more like a Citroen, but the DS line of Citroens. So, I was going to say it was the kind of car that uh, in Harry Potter Uncle Vernon Dursley would have bought, but no, it's not. It's the neighbour who Uncle Vernon didn't like very much, but who's on the same salary but had some curiously liberal thoughts. So Vernon didn't like him. He'd have loved this car. Because that's the thing about these Hillmans and, and the Humbers, in fact, all the Roots Group cars. Although this car was competing with mainstream rivals like Ford, Vauxhall, and the Austins and Morrises of the day, they did things just a little bit more panache. Things like consulting Raymond Lowy for his design influence. People consider him to be the father of modern industrial design, so adding his influence to the dashboard and the fins and making the car just look a bit more exciting and interesting goes a long way to making a car which is potentially no better, but certainly feels more special. A 1.6 litre engine was good going for a car of this size and this class at that time. And it meant it was an 80 mile an hour car. This thing could crack 80. Not to 60 was less impressive at 21.6 seconds, so uh, you might want to take a running jump at a few things. But the fuel economy wasn't too bad though. You probably get about 28 miles to the gallon out of one of these driving normally. So this thing really grips well. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed how well it sticks to the road. It's really, really good. The ride is lovely, it's very supple, but just a little bit stiff and it just grips through the corners really well. I like this car a lot. Now people forget that at one time the Roots Group was one of the biggest car manufacturers and distributors in the world. Off the top of my head I'm going to forget a couple of these. Obviously they had Hillman, Humber, Singer, Comma, Carrier, but before they became manufacturers they were actually car distributors, that's how they kind of became big. 
and so this car was made in several places around the world as well as in the UK. It's also built in Port Melbourne, Australia and Petone in New Zealand. I'm sure I said those wrong. Wow, this really does grip well. I'm actually outrunning Mark on Focus in front and they really do handle well. In other markets outside the UK, it was known as the Singer Vogue, the Humber Vogue or the Humber Scepter, depending where you were buying it in the world and what part of the empire. Well, thank you for joining me today in this beautiful Supermix. It's funny to think that once upon a time, Roots Group was one of the biggest car companies on the planet and now they've been swallowed up and just completely disappeared. But their products were always just so good, just a real cut above, just something special. And so driving the Superminx, which is unrestored, just fresh paint at some point in the not-too-distant past, but other... And so driving this one, which is, apart from a bit of fresh paint a few years ago, is completely original, and wow, it drives so well. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this, please hit like and subscribe and hit the bell notification down there so you'll see when new stuff is coming out, because every week there's going to be something different, and hopefully from next week there's going to be Modern Mondays as a semi-regular new car feature as well. Join me again next time for something completely different. Goodbye.